Hello and welcome to Wisdom 101. We have a special guest today. I'm going to interview Cindy Silva. And uh, Cindy Silva is a genetic intuitive somatic movement teacher, a yoga, yoga, Pilates, and Qigong instructor, a communal leader, human design analyst, and creative visionary. Cindy educates, inspires, and empowers individuals and groups as a facilitator of workshops, webinars, classes, and personal sessions. She has natural ability and passion to integrate leading edge scientific research with timeless mystical concepts. Her role is to transmit wisdom in practical terms that inspires curiosity in the direction of discovering our intimate purpose and liberating our ever expanding creative potential. I'm very excited to have you here. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Nate. It's really sweet of you to invite me and um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Awesome. So from your um, introduction, uh, obviously you're a multifaceted uh, healer and leader and teacher, and we could go in any of these directions, uh, but you and I met through the context of Qigong and yoga. And so I thought maybe we'd start there and hear a little bit about how you got into all that, what you're doing with it now and where you see things are going. Oh, yeah, thank you for that opening. Ah, it was interesting listening to you read my bio, to be honest. I'm usually in your position and doing interviews. It's one of the things I love to do. Um, so I guess, you know, creativity, you know, and the way you ended it is where I'll begin is creativity is what, I mean, life is about creativity and I feel like my role, regardless of what I'm doing and how I'm serving people or holding space, is to hold space for that creativity to emerge, to be witnessed, to be nurtured. Um, and so whether it be through Qigong or yoga or any of the things that I've studied and come along the way of this journey, uh, it really leads back to creativity and how to liberate the creativity that is moving through us like we are a creative movement and sometimes that creative movement can get stalled or stuck or we can be confused about it um, depending on certain patterns that we have in our belief system and our perspectives and our um, daily rhythms or anything can get sticky and block us from that you know block the flow that's moving through us or distort it. And so I feel like my role is to hold space for making that visible or tangible in a way that we can see it and then finding the tools that we can bring in to uh, integrate into the space, the awareness and the perspective to help unwind some of those um, tight spots that creativity can get stuck in. Mm, nice. I like that a lot. And you made me think of um, this graph that a friend just sent me, and um, it was this amazing kind of integration of the the three brain model, kind of the brain stem, the limbic, and the neocortex, and our basic needs of kind of safety, love, and significance. And they had this this graph where it was creativity on one end and reactivity on the other. And as you were saying that, you know, your role as, as holding space and kind of fulfilling those needs for a safe space, for projecting and holding a sense of love and belonging and seeing the significance in others, it really does seem like that's a, a formula that is now being shown through neuroscience perspective, mm -hmm. that this can actually really encourage and unlock people's creativity. Um, so yeah, tell us more, how do you facilitate that as a teacher? What kind of tools or strategies would you use? Yeah, thanks for sharing that model. Um, I'm really happy to hear, yeah, that science is, is moving in that direction. I come at it more from what people would probably call a mystical perspective or an intuitive perspective um, that can't be necessarily measured by science, although I appreciate and respect science and I love how science and mysticism are coming together. Uh, my perspective is that it's all consciousness. Everything is consciousness. We are consciousness. Uh, we're in the process of, you know, um, 
consciousness moving through these forms, these vehicles of uh, the human form and all other forms. And it's seeking to uh, exchange information with itself in these different forms, yeah? Mm -hmm. And when, we're, when I'm working with an individual, whether it's doing their human design chart or yoga or Qigong or any of the ways that I can support people, it's, it's not really to liberate the personality to their creativity, but more to, to move. It's like awakening is more of a destructive process than anything mm. because consciousness is already awake and that's what we are. But as it moves through these forms, it, it bumps into the sleepiness of us not realizing that we are that consciousness. So it's really about moving, um, creating more bandwidth through the vehicle for consciousness to move more freely. And there's a quote that I love that I uh, repeat often by David Bohm. And it's, he says, consciousness is seeking a form that allows its fullest expression. So I feel like my role is to be a witness to, to listen to the language of where people, uh, individuals' perspectives are limiting in that capacity where they don't see themselves as a vehicle for consciousness, that the vehicle itself is consciousness, um, the process of seeing is consciousness. It's all about how we've identified with limitation through the physical senses uh, we've identified with the body which is consciousness but it's just a small percentage of mm, the totality mm. of what's here that's creating through us so i see myself as more liberating consciousness than liberating the individual because um yeah that's just the the way it gets done through here as far as what I see and what I'm aware of. Not that I'm not interested in the person being fulfilled by their creative potential, but my intention is to liberate that for the benefit of all, not just that individual. Mm. It sounds like you're seeing people perhaps differently than they see themselves. Whereas, like you said, they might see themselves as an individual and Kind of separate or their body their ego their physical self and you're seeing that but you're also kind of seeing through that from that perspective of mysticism that they are a consciousness that has a purpose that's trying to like that quote says fulfill its greatest potential or uh, seeking a form to experience something new and that 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 potential is innate it's not something that you're giving them or uh you know that they're even necessarily creating it's already there and they're either inhibiting it kind of blocking it getting in the way or allowing it and it sounds like you're finding tools to help people kind of allow that through and see what happens yeah yeah i'm just giggling inside myself because when you said that that consciousness is innate it's uh. literally innate it is <laughs> that is you innate <laughs> In Nate, in Cindy, in Richard, in Sarah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 it's true. It's just, it's, it's all about perception. You know, I had a teacher who said perception isn't everything. It's the only thing. And mm -hmm. sometimes the only thing we need to do to liberate consciousness and its creative potential is to change our perception. Mm -hmm. That's what's blocking, you know, that flow when we're feeling under pressure or confused um, in a tight spot, it's usually because there is more of us as consciousness wanting to move through and into the world, into itself, to relate to itself more freely. But our perception is too tight and narrow to allow that. So there's a pressure that builds um, until we crack somehow through seeing ourselves differently or having some kind of an accident or losing our job or some kind of a shock. It usually requires some kind of a shock. And then we see things differently, which creates a little bit wider of an aperture generally for that which was wanting to move through to come in and be integrated. 
Mm-hmm. And there's always a little bit of chaos, you know, when, the, when you integrate something new, like you recently integrated a new baby into your life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, mm-hmm. before being a father, you had a perception of what that would be like. And then after becoming a father, you had a reality of what that was like. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right. And there, and and now you have been transformed. Your identity is completely different. You're not the same person. You don't have the same role. Your whole life has reorganized organized itself around this this new life that you're responsible for. And so sometimes we are we are carrying something that is ours to bring to the world, and it is like bringing a baby into the world. We we nurture it, you know. We, we invest all our energy and time and uh, mm. a lot of commitment into that. Um, and then we offer it to the world and there's vulnerability in that. It's like when, you know, you have a child and you've invested in it, you want to uh, make sure it's stable and protected before you launch it, you know, and let it um, be exposed to all of the, what do I want to say? Um, adventures mm. that are in store for it as it it's now in the world being projected upon right it's a lot of projection that um, we experience in our creative process um, so it's it's not a comfortable ride you know it's not always comfortable and um, it's just helpful to have people in your life who've been through it and um, understand sort of the process because there's some beliefs that it's going to be this incredible joyful ride and there are definitely those moments but there's also the moments of you know sort of excruciating vulnerability and um, loss and um, challenge and leaving behind certain things that are no longer going to be part of this movement and so there's grief and things that go along with um dying to what is to be reborn to what what is becoming and I feel like we're in that process you know as a collective in our evolution as a species Um, and so we're all experiencing that more individually because there's a a process within a process Mm. happening right yeah I kind of like I like what you're saying about um if it, it can kind of break us open and it, it kind of seems like there's there I had a teacher once say that you either jump or you get pushed and mm. it's like the the growth the experience of our fullness is inevitable and we're going to either do it by ourselves or you know deliberately you know with teachers with community of course not alone but by ourselves our own initiative or life kind of squeezes us out, you know, and and pushes us or situations happen. And because we haven't taken on that expanded version of ourself, we struggle and suffer. And it seems like there's kind of, um, (laughs) there's a, I've got a friend here jumping in for those in the podcast, cats joining us. Um, So it seems like these practices and these tools are in some ways, Kind of preparing for the inevitable perhaps so that that process isn't quite so disruptive or so torturous it seems like we do have some agency there in terms of like we're gonna go but we can either be dragged behind the car or we can get in the car and drive right it's it seems like we do have some agency there but there's no question that we're gonna grow and we're gonna go right yeah yeah yeah, and I love that the the creature came in, you know, to the frame because we are creature, you know, our body is a creature, it's an animal and it has instincts and it has needs, right? And it's really geared to survive. And some of the things that we put it through, uh, you know, as ourself, but in a limited form with a limited perspective, it it's threatened, right? It's security is threatened. And so it reacts, right? And we have to contend with that. We have to hold space for that. And um, yeah, it's like, if you're going to bring your daughter to do something for the first time, she's never been exposed to that, there'll be some fear, but you know, it's good for her. So you're going to, you know, hold that space for her to explore and experience, but also hold space for her to feel 
threatened and and fear and and then nurture or you know um, comfort that. So we have to be that for ourselves when we go through these experiences and not deny that there are aspects of ourselves that aren't necessarily um, as excited about the changes as our mind might be, right? Or our, um, yeah, our muse, you know, we have a muse that wants to, us to move on with things, but it doesn't have the perspective of the, the body and the needs of the body and the security of the body. So we have to kind of hold a balance for both of those. And yeah, the practices really help because they bring us from wherever, whatever state we're in, you know, information is state bound. So if we're in a tight, fearful space, we only have access to a limited amount of information. So if we're only navigating that realm of fear, of primal fear, we don't have the bigger perspective of, perspective of what's actually available um, and emerging. Um, so when we change our state through practice, we enter different uh, wavelengths, if you will. Um, and, at, and information is available there that isn't in this other state. Like in a tight, contracted state of fear, there's no circulation of light. And when we unwind, it's like the DNA unwinding and opening up, then this light that's trapped in there can circulate through the system and we start to have insights and epiphanies that are always available, but only in certain states of relaxation. Mm. So we try to get, get us ourselves with, you know, transporting ourselves. So, you know, there's often talk about how um, we're transforming energy, like we're transforming fear into love. I don't see it that way. Um, I think fear is fear and love is love, like red is red and blue is blue. We're not really changing red to blue. We're moving from red to blue. We're transporting ourselves, really, not transforming something. Not that things can't be transformed, but um, mm. it's more about learning how to navigate the planes of reality and using tools that are vehicles for moving us between these states. Mm. I like that. I like that reframe of personal growth or transformation as as a transportation, uh, as a vehicle, as a movement. And it sounds like you've discovered and utilized many different tools to navigate. Um, how do people hone in on which tools are most appropriate or most useful? And uh, how would you also help somebody who comes there and knows that they're not really feeling the way they want to feel or not in the place they want to be? Uh, where would you start or what tools can you offer somebody who's feeling that way? Hmm. Yeah, good question. Let's see. I think it's a process of trial and error, right? Like I, I have tools I use that may not be uh, sufficient for other people or attractive. It's all about what a person resonates with, right? And so we, through the process of our life, we attract different things at different times. Mm -hmm. um, Certainly in the beginning, I was using different tools than I am now because I'm in a different phase of my life. And um, so your question about how to offer the person the right tool, I think the first tool or the first introduction is to help the person see themselves differently. And I do that you know, largely with the tool um, that you mentioned in my bio called human design. And this is, a tool that I've seen and witnessed over the years help people to relax about um, things that they've been trying to change about themselves and whole, their whole lives. They now can see that that's just how they're designed and they can stop trying to fix and change themselves if they just lean into this uh, as, as a way a process that's uh, natural for them. Um, sometimes we've been, you know, conditioned to away from our naturality, especially if we've been raised by people who don't have that same kind of configuration, right? And they're operating differently. And so 
we get projected upon to operate in a way that's not natural for us. And we try to change the way that's natural for us. Um, and then at some point in our life, something comes into our awareness that confirms that what we've been um, leaning into or um, what we've been trying to change about ourselves is actually the way to our creativity. Mm. If we just turn and face it, sort of like how we try in, we've been conditioned away from feeling, right? Culturally in this part of the world anyway, in the West. And um, we get to a point in our life where we learn that turning towards our feeling is actually an emotive process that gives us energy in terms of, uh, I would say transmuting some of the um, denser energies mm -hmm. and liberating some of these more uh, fluid, um, connective types of uh, perspectives where we're we're not isolated as much. We're now experiencing ourselves as being part of a community, something larger. We start attracting people and resources and experiences into our lives that really start to bring that talent forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I was lucky enough to have a human design reading with Cindy and my wife as well. We both found it just incredibly insightful and useful. And um, it really is amazing how, like you said, you're, I understand uh, human design is combining several different systems together and connecting to your kind of blueprint, your imprint. Uh, and as you said, kind of accepting these pieces of ourself so that we can lean into them and not just try to uh, model ourselves on celebrities or leaders or our parents or our influences around us, uh, who, you know, whatever what we look up to, but rather, like you said, find the acceptance of ourself and within that is actually our greatest gifts when we don't run from it and tune into it. So uh, yeah. tell us more about human design in, in your own words. How did you come into that system and what, what have you experienced through studying and teaching it? Hmm. Thank you. Well, human design is um, a logical system with mystical origins. And those aren't my words, but that's just the way it's been described. And I agree with that definition. Um, it's a synthesis of multiple systems, including the I Ching, um, astrology, Kabbalah, and the chakra system. Um, I think of it not like how, it's not like somebody came in and put them all together and made correspondences. It's not like that at all. For me, the way I see it is that our design was always a synthesis of um, all these perspectives, but they each got sort of um, branched out in fractals, if you will, in different cultures and studied independently. And now they're sort of coming back together and the system is 35 years old. I've been studying it for about 20 years. Um, I just feel like it gives people permission to be who themselves. It gives them a um, what's considered in human design a strategy for living as themselves, but also it shows us where we're vulnerable to being conditioned away from our natural um, talent. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's such a vast field and such a big topic. Um, and any anyone you have, um, the opportunity to have a session with, a chart with, um, you'll get a totally different perspective. I mean, when I'm sitting with someone, I know there's hundreds of hours of information uh, here and I have an hour and a half with them. And so I have over the years um, just watched how my um, intuitive capacity is really bound to the language and the structure of this system. And I also integrate the gene keys, which is another beautiful system um, related to the I Ching and a spectrum of consciousness that we operate out of. And so I'm really opening myself as um, a 
perceptive tool to feel into intuitively what's the most important thing in this moment for this person um, related to the current transits and everything and then let that kind of pour into what gets shared as like a transmission that comes through and i'm really listening to the language because our language tells us where we're operating out of the spectrum of consciousness are we in the um the end of the spectrum considered the shadow in the gene keys um which is more of a separateness and where the dna is wound tight like i mentioned before or are we operating more out of a uh what would be considered a gift frequency where we see ourselves as part of the whole um and we're cooperative and wanting to um, see other people's talent get honored and respected and appreciated as well as our own and to, to serve in that way by supporting other people's creativity, not just wanting our own to be supported. And then also there's a higher frequency called a city, which is a, a Hindu word coming from that Eastern tradition about like, um, uh, what would you say, kind of like a superpower or a um, super consciousness that's um, not limited by form. It's a formless, um, expansive um, ability that we have as consciousness. And how do we bring that into the form in a way that integrates with the structure, you know, that life is these forms are structures through which consciousness gets expressed. Um, and so when I'm listening to the language, I want to listen for where that person is um, primarily operating out of. And then if it's um, if there's limitation in the language, which indicates that that's where their perspective is, we want to introduce concepts that expand that, right? And then introduce or invite not just concepts but direct experience in that direction so that they can experience themselves differently and as they do that they begin to identify with those experiences and the identity starts to shift from um, the separateness to being belonging to something larger and kind of losing the self a little bit you know we want to we want to let go of the self enough um, so that it isn't, um, so we don't have the blinders on mm. to our, how we affect and are affected by each other, which is, again, all back to being pure consciousness, having an experience of itself in all these different forms in relationship to itself. And we're just really wanting to liberate that because um, there's so much that wants to be exchanged and revealed. It's, it's um, that quote by Carl Sagan, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. And so for myself and for my clients, I, I brought those two quotes that I've shared today together. And I, I enter my work and my service through this concept that Consciousness is seeking a form that allows something incredible to be known. Mm. And, and we're all that form. We're all that portal. And I've, I've, my role is to um, point out what I see that gets in the way of that. And also um, be someone who can look at pattern recognition and see the patterns in people's lives and their language. Um, and what that's revealing and what might be some, some of the hidden um, gems that have always been there, but not really recognized for um, this other great question we can ask is why am I attracted to what I'm attracted to? You know, there's a reason we're attracted to what we're attracted to. And it has something to do with us bringing our talent into the world. Mm. Right. So holding space for that is my answer to your question in a long lot of words. <laughs> yeah, that was beautifully said. 
I like the um, that idea of your kind of tuning in to their um, their potential. And um, it seems like a lot of people, everybody has this potential to tune into their like broader self. Um, but I think a lot of us doubt it or we talk ourselves out of it or we, we, like you said, we might throw a lot of language, a lot of um, obstacles in the way. And it sounds like you're able to look through the, the version of themselves that's small and limited to the infinite potential of their true nature and kind of shine a light on the path that that might be uh, shining for them and uh, what they're attracted to, what they're drawn to seems to hold a key uh, with some self-inquiry about why am I attracted to this? What does it have to do with my potential, my growth, my expansion? Um, so I wanted to also talk about that intuitive process because it is so interesting how, like you said, I, I had a, a human design reading from somebody else several years before. I found it really, really useful and helpful. And it was completely different facet. It was the same you know, information that I gave the person, but I got very different information. But it was exactly what I needed in that moment. It was, it was really helpful. And again, when I met with you, it was the same story. I was in a different stage of my life. And um, it seems like that ability to tune into our intuition is kind of, uh, this almost gives you a, a vocabulary or a language or a, a map to help guide intuition into what is needed between the interaction. And uh, I, I know that both of us have talked about this before in terms of like say a Qigong class where you don't know why, but you start talking about a certain concept of Qigong and the three treasures suddenly you know, comes to mind and you talk about it and then somebody in class is saying, that was just what I needed to hear. And it seems like as a, as a facilitator for this, we're, if we're in that tuned in state, we now have access to lots of these tools and we can pick and choose like, what is being called forward? What can I offer in this moment? So it sounds like if somebody works with you, you have a vast array of tools and you're gonna tune into what is kind of happening in between you on an energetic level, what's needing to be heard, what's needing to be said. And, um, it sounds like that's part of your role in helping facilitate this growth for folks. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, when I was first trained as an analyst, you know, I would um, look at someone's chart and I'd spend an hour on it before I actually met with them and really study it. And that was part of my learning. But then, uh, you know, shortly after I realized that um, I wasn't even sharing what I had you know, found in my <laughs> investigation. It was just stuff that else, something else coming through that was more um, in the moment. It's about being in the moment. And so I started to, over time, trust that, even though I would still prepare just as a backup, you know, and I'd find um, I was spending, you know, two and a half hours on um, a session. And then, you know, I wasn't using that so eventually you know I trusted more and just showed up and started to allow a process to happen it was the same when I started teaching yoga oh I don't know over 24 years ago or something now and I would you know go through and create a whole routine and um, study it and um, memorize it and get on the mat and start and something else would come through and I would just uh, over time learned to trust that and realized that what I was preparing for was a different moment than when I was showing up to execute on that and that what wanted to come through in the moment was different than what I had prepared and so I think it's just about trust and over time witnessing how like you said um, students will come up and say that that was really helpful it's exactly what I needed or um, and it's just about getting, I think, more um, out of the, the need for um, even that, even hearing that it was what someone needed or 
Um, not that we need that, it's helpful and it's great when people do that, but um, yeah, just trusting um, that something's getting done through me. I'm not the doer, you know, not, I don't know, I hope that doesn't sound irresponsible, but it just is what my experience is that I, I'm totally there, totally present, aware of everything that's occurring but I'm also tracking and holding space for um, this uniqueness that happens like when you and I come together or myself and a client, there's this um, mystical third, I call it, or this transcendent function, right? Where you are an energy field and I'm an energy field. We come together and a different field is created from our, the combination. And that field is a vehicle that's unique that will never happen again in the same way. Even if you and I show up again next week and do this, it would be a completely different conversation. Yeah. Um, and just tr trusting that um, that vehicle that's being formed through the chemistry, um, the fractal geometry of our unique movement in life is creating something unique that's filling up with, with a, um, an awareness and we're really relating to that, not so much each other. Like I'm not relating directly to you. I'm relating to you through the combination of, of us, right? There's a we here in this space. And that's really what I'm um, sharing in the process of being in space with someone and looking at their chart. Or sometimes I feel like, you know, the um the design is is there and it's why we came together but something else depending on the person has has um come in to be made known that doesn't have that much to do with the chart or what why they think they came but um that that that's like what my intuition is tracking is what's the most potent energy in the field to share in this moment that will help liberate consciousness through this individual through this vehicle mm. yeah I, I see that all the time like with especially when I was working in a physical studio you know I'd get people walking in all the time and saying like oh you know I'm here to improve my golf game or oh you know I uh I want to you know, pick up a gift certificate for my wife, but maybe I'll try a class or, oh, you know, my doctor said this would be good for me. And people come in almost like reluctantly or kind of haphazardly or one of my studios that I worked in was next to a, a hardware store. You know, people would like all of a sudden, you know, I had to go get a hammer and then I saw your studio and these kind of serendipitous paths that people take um, can, can actually be this this kind of guided uh, process where they then come to experience what they needed, even though they didn't know exactly what they're looking for or the path to take. Um, and it sounds like that's uh, often these tools can be that holding a space and a template. And like you said, then allowing this third party, this um, kind of uh, amalgamation of our broader selves that come together and reveal something. Uh, it's like if I'm red and you're blue, you're looking at the purple. Like you're looking at the yeah. that that combination that has appeared as a result of both of us coming together, or you and a client not looking at red, looking at me, and just saying, "Oh, here's what you are." But yeah, through our combination, we're actually seeing something that's being revealed that wouldn't actually be possible to see without the relationship without those dual perspectives teaming up together totally yeah it's all about that relationship yeah think about the words you know relationship ship being a vessel right and we mm. think about uh, partnership relationship friendship you know there's it's a vessel it's a container mm. um it's um, the Sufi tradition talks about this. It's, the term is sobet, H-O-H-B-E-T. And it's about um, conversation being the highest form of prayer, mm. you know, conscious conversation um, about things like this. 
So there's mm -hmm. contemplation and meditation, and then there's conversation, so bet. Um, and it's, it's a very high form of communion. And like I said, my perspective, and that's all I can ever offer. So what, whatever I share, it's only a perspective. It's not the truth. It's not everybody's truth or the truth. It's one truth from this point of view. Um, one of, you know, nine billion or more on the planet or, you know, include all the species and it's infinite, one of infinite perspective. Um, so just to not take ourselves so seriously, right? And be playful too about um, when I see things and people that are limitation, um, I have them myself, right? I mean, I, I don't see my own as much. My husband sees them, <laughs> but you know, he's very kind about pointing them out, which is great. And I wanna be that kind, you know, resource and mirror for people as well to, be playful about it and, um, you know, not, not make it a job. A lot of times when I share insights, people will say, oh, I need to work on that. And they'll say, no, you don't have to work on it. Just realize it's already being done. That's why it's coming into awareness, right? It's coming into your conscious awareness because it's already in process. It's already happening. And if we turn it into a project and, and try to work on it, we just get in the way. Um, something you said earlier reminded me of the dream state and I think that that's really and I had never thought of it this way before until you said that that's why I love conversations like this because they bring out new things and it, it's like this is what you know our subconscious is doing all the time in our dreams is it's pointing out to us um, often ways in which we are limiting the flow of consciousness through our personality, through our um, not letting, you know, ourselves really become whole because we have some judgments about certain parts of ourselves um, and others, of course, we project that. So I, I'll have to yeah. contemplate that a little deeper, but yeah, I feel like Oftentimes when I'm in a session with someone, I am the voice for their subconscious. Mm -hmm. you know, it's more of a waking dream. It's, and uh, I experience those regularly. You know, my life mm. I have an experience and I'm realizing I'm, you know, this is a waking dream. This, this is a, a character in a dream. And if I were to interpret that, like I had a dream, what was my feeling? What was the feeling tone? What was the message? And um, those are just as valuable to me. Even when I work with a client, you know, my clients are my teachers, my students are my teachers. They're always bringing things up that um, I know if it's in my field, there's something there for me to look at. I don't want to turn it into a project or um, a problem to solve, but I do want to. Um, take note of it, get curious about it, let it have its way with any limitations that might be um, ready to let go. And yeah, just again, this whole idea of we're all consciousness is realizing that everyone that comes into your life that you interact with is you in another form. And um, when we come from the perspective that life is conspiring on its own behalf, consciousness is conspiring on its own behalf. It's just wanting us to broaden the lens through which it can reach through and into itself in other forms. And kind of like if you go to a different country and you don't speak the same language, you know the, the kind of the angst or the efforting that goes on to try to find that common language so that you can communicate and exchange information. That's that's what I perceive consciousness is doing when we're either sitting with a tree or another person or a um, a pet or any any other life form that both are containing consciousness, seeking a way to exchange information and finding that common language, and it's not always words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
in fact, it's probably mostly non-words, right? It's, it's, it is interesting, you know, having cats, anyone with pets or interacting with animals knows that there is very real interaction and energetic exchange. And like you said, working with people in other cultures, I, I married into a Persian family and, uh, you know, my parents-in-law don't really speak much English. I don't speak much Farsi, but we can have like long, you know, dinners together and we can converse and in our, you know, gestures and, you know, smiles and, and you can feel each other's energy. You can feel each other's uh, consciousness. And you're right. It's, it really is interesting to think about that in terms of the, the broader perspective. And you brought up dreaming. It's interesting where when you're in a dream state, it's kind of like those limitations, those physical rules get removed and consciousness now has this open recess, this playground where it can take different forms. It can manifest anything instantly. And some of the, the, the rules of physical reality don't apply anymore. And so consciousness has this freer realm to explore the process. And I think that is a very valuable state to be conscious of because it can reveal a lot about what we can then bring to our waking life. We're studying the the four agreements, as you probably know, the famous uh -huh. book and um, Don Miguel Ruiz, and he starts the book saying life is a dream, and uh, we're we're dreaming reality. It it really doesn't have any more uh, any more substance than a dream, and yet we we're looking for this sense of stability and predictability, and I think that's why a lot of folks can be very skeptical or suspicious of the intuitive approach or the, the mystic, mystical approach because they want something that is always the same that can be repeated over and over and it's always consistent and we want that sense of security but the more we study mysticism or quantum physics the more science is actually expanding and studying dark matter and antimatter and we're starting to realize reality is anything but predictable and uh you know, Newtonian physics is starting to break down when we look close enough. And uh, there's a real value and perhaps the only security then is knowing that there is no security because then we can kind of ride the wave a little bit more. We don't cling and, and we aren't afraid of that unpredictability. We just learn to navigate it, like you said, and um, not be limited by it, but accepting it as painful and unsettling as it might be that might be the path of most joy and uh, growth as well mm. beautiful yeah that reminds me of the I Ching you know the book of change although you know there is change there are cycles that are predictable mm. and you know cycles within cycles and um there is a, a flow to the universe, you know, and this is what I feel why you and I have been attracted to yoga and Qigong and to teach it to others, to lead others into those experiences. It's about direct experience of the, the Tao, if you will, or the larger flow. Like if we get in flow within ourselves, right? If we find a way to be in harmony and peace with ourself, even though that's not static, that's always changing. Mm -hmm. We tend to then resonate and attract the, the flow and get pulled into, if you will, or absorbed into a larger flow that's um, a planetary flow. And that flow is part of a larger flow of the solar system and the galaxy. And, um, you know, those concepts are very large and, um, sometimes a little esoteric, but we know when we're in the flow and we have synchronistic experiences, right? When we're really um, experiencing things that are outside of logic, right? It can't be explained by logic. And the more of those experiences we have, the more we trust. Um, and the more for me uncomfortable it is to not be in flow. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is like, I think even sometimes an Achilles heel for me that I'm so accustomed to being in flow that when I'm not, um, it's really uncomfortable. Yeah. So I, you know, um, and I get agitated when I'm not in flow. So 
I don't have as much freedom anymore, <laughs> like I used to, to, um, to not do my practice or to eat things that um, take me out of that flow. Um, and, you know, in some ways, I don't like it. In other ways, I'm grateful for that, right? So it's almost like when you're young, you can eat anything and you can drink and party and your your body can tolerate that. <laughs> you can go on and then you hit a certain age and you, you know, you put on weight or um, you just don't feel good and you you can't get away with as much. Um, with the jing, you know, we can talk about the jing and, and the relationship to that. Um, but there is you know, for myself being an intuitive and being a sensitive and being completely um, open in my peripheral awareness, I take in a lot of information and I have a lot of interests and I'm you know, spinning a lot of plates and um, that's always been um, exciting for me. I like the, the novelty and the diversity and um, yeah, what do I want to say? There's another word like the stimulation. There's something there for me. And um, knowing my own design, of course. But now, as I'm getting older, you know, into my late 50s, I'm noticing that um, the multitasking is not as satisfying, right? It's actually draining. And my attention is becoming more and more narrow, which in one way, you know, is a limitation, but it's, it's an incredible freedom that um, when I'm really committed to the thing that's most important to me, um, all the other distractions are not decisions. I don't have to make all these decisions anymore. It's already done. I already know what my focus is. We're in my life to this point or, you know, a few years prior, I didn't really have a focus. Um, I mean, there was a focal um, thread running through everything, but um, now it's like things are kind of folding in and folding in, creating more of a narrowness, which um, it feels good, even though it's very different. I'm getting um, comfortable in that, and it's actually creating more flow and not less. Um, so, of course, that feeds my my flow junkie kind of <laughs> pattern of, you know, lining up with something larger, right? So that things become more effortless because it's not my effort that's flowing here as much as um, this greater flow that's recognizing itself in, in my system. And um, that's, that's really what I'm trying to get, you know, help people find is that recognition when something else is um, operating that's pulling us in the direction of the way we're designed um, to serve, to give, and that we're each carrying something unique that belongs to the collective. And um, when our life lines up in a way that we can be in the right place at the right time with the right people to see that and identify with it and then nurture it out into the world and see others benefit from it that's that's really the ultimate experience I think in life is to give what you're here to give and see other people receive it benefit from it and feel appreciated for it mm. be cherished right. I think we all want to be cherished and that's the way we want to be cherished is for bringing what we're here to bring. Right. I think that's, that's so true. You know, it's like when people compliment us on things that we don't really value or don't identify with, it's different than when somebody really sees our gifts and recognizes that. And, and that, that sense of, okay, now I know that you're seeing who I really am, not just my outer appearance or whatever or outer personality i think that is such a gift to um to have somebody who can see that in you so for somebody who's feeling that way who's uh maybe they're slightly out of flow and they're wanting to get back into it or they're just wanting some insights some uh, guidance to 
some of their own intrinsic designs and blueprints for what they may be able to tap into and, and harness and cultivate in this lifetime. Uh, how would somebody get in touch with you and, and what would that process be like to explore working with you around that? Mm. Thank you, Nate. Well, my website is geneticalchemy.com. It's also my name, cindysilva.com. Um, so my my work there on geneticalchemy.com is, is the combination of human design, gene keys, epigenetics, um, in terms of working with me as a Qigong instructor. Um, I'm only teaching locally here in Avila Beach, where I live in California. Um, Maybe eventually I'll teach again on Zoom. That was fun, but I just love teaching in person in nature. So if you're local, certainly um, you can look me up on avalabeachqigong.com. Um, I teach at a local club here and I love, all my students are just so wonderful and um, supportive and curious. And you know, I'd say wherever you are, find a teacher, find someone who's modeling flow and creativity and um yeah maybe inquire about how to um be supported and you know i'm some people have mentors in life and that's lovely i wish everyone would have a mentor right that would be a way to fast track your creativity i i didn't have a mentor per se i've had lots of teachers and all i appreciate all my teachers you're one of them nate i love your classes and your instruction um, your creativity attracted me. Um, but what I've seen in my life, even though I haven't had a mentor as an individual, I've always attracted community around me based on sharing what I am finding that works and having a love for wisdom and sharing wisdom. Um, I've always attracted uh, groups of people around me, whether we were studying a book or doing yoga or qigong or human design. And I found that the community is a muse for me. That's turned out to be my mentor. Um, it's like a larger vehicle. In um, Gene Keys, we call it a synarchy. And it's like um, consciousness is operating through a vehicle of multiple people. And it's drawing out of me something that I, I can't see on my own. Right. But I can see it when I'm in this group and they're asking questions and drawing the wisdom out and reflecting back. And um, and I'm always getting guidance from that field on what is the next step to take. And that next step is always a little bit of a stretch. Right. It's a little bit of a, mm -hmm. an uncomfortableness to go there. Um, that means there's growth. Right. If it's unfamiliar, it's uncomfortable. And that's the growing edge. It's never too uncomfortable that, you know, that uh, I want to um, snap back in fear. It's just uncomfortable enough to stretch. And um, yeah, so I, I recommend, you know, um, yeah, check out my website if you're interested in human design and having a reading or um, yeah, that's, there's some testimonials there so you can get a sense of what other people have experienced. Um, but if, yeah, I would just say find teachers in your own community that um, are in harmony and alignment that are modeling what it is um, you know is in you, but you haven't really brought forward yet and um, ask for their guidance. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. And uh, for those who, who love to read and, and want the weekly inspiration, I always look forward to Cindy's newsletters. She calls them e-newsletters and uh, there's musings, there's, it's, it was so different when I, when I typed in my name and put my email, you know, I, I wanted to stay in touch with you and uh, I consider you a teacher as well and, and somebody who's helped me uh, tremendously. And so I was like, oh, okay, I'll find out about her workshops and this and that. And, and I was blown away at uh, just this every week, like unwrapping a gift, like, like a, a package that somebody has thoughtfully put together and and curated you bring every week a, a new concept and it's very 
much in, in your style. It's intuitive. It's what's, what's, you know, active and alive in your world and your community. You know, it'll yeah. be a concept on dreams. And then the next week, you know, it'll be something about what is wisdom and you'll draw together interviews and clips. And, um, and then there's always kind of a, like you said, that synchronicity, you know, stories from your life and, and your amazing community that, um, that are eludicating these, these concepts. So even if you can't meet with Cindy in person, um, you know, sign up for her newsletter. It's always an inspiration and um, do check her out. I really highly recommend getting a reading done. Uh, it was so helpful for us, for me and Roya. She's, um, she's in love with you as well. And, and uh, you've helped her as a mentor. And, um, yeah. and I really like what you said about building community. I think a lot of our listeners are teachers and healers in one way or another and, and are um, participating and growing community. And um, it's so important if we're in that giving position to also be a receiver, to tune into those that we can gain inspiration from and we do build each other up. So um, I'll put links to all of your websites and, and information in, in this interview. And, uh, I do encourage folks to check it out. Thank you so much for your time today for this wonderful conversation. Thank you. And thank you. Say hi to Roya. She's a delight to work with. And um, thank you for sharing about my newsletter. I just have one more thing to say for people because you brought it up is that um, like writing is a flow flow for me. I get into flow when I write. I get into flow when I do yoga, qigong, um, when I do readings. And so whatever gets you in flow, do that more and more often and then stack your flow events. So um, you know, I like to cook and that's a flow event for me. So if I cook and I write and I do Qigong um, in a mountain nature, I'm, I'm multiplying my flow in, on a daily basis and stacking flow events. And eventually I start to identify with flow, right? And then what you um, have faith in grows. So put your faith in what you want to grow and um, find what what creates flow for you and, and engage with it as often as possible.